good afternoon. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, uh, Arvo Master. Arvo is a, a friend and a longtime colleague. Uh, he was dean at Columbia when I was dean at the University of Michigan. So we have a lot of war stories to talk about. <laughs> So I did his uh, dental training at the State University of New York at Stony Brook and continued his training uh, where he got his Master of Medical Sciences from Harvard University and specialty training in periodontology. He served on the faculty of uh, uh, Harvard School of Dental Medicine, Fairleigh Dickinson College of Dental Medicine, and Columbia University College of Dental Medicine, where he also served as dean from 2001 to 2012. And then again, from, he served as a senior vice president of the Medical Center from 2006 to 2012. He currently is professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Columbia Mellon School of Public Health. Now, his research has focused on diagnostic testing and risk assessment for periodontal disease and the interrelationship of periodontal disease and systemic disease and oral health care needs of older adults and the future of dental education and practice. He's an established health sciences researcher who is highly regarded as an accomplished mentor, scholar, motivator, and seasoned administrator who has fostered innovation in dental education by promoting scholarship and scientific rigor. So please extend a warm mission and welcome to Dr. Lamster, who's going to talk about diabetes and oral health, lessons learned, and implications for the future of the dental profession. So thank you. I, I uh, certainly want to thank Peter for the invitation uh, to come back to the University of, of Michigan. It's always good to start with a little bit of a story. So the last time I was here, I had uh, an hour off at some point, and I went to the University of Michigan book, bookstore. And um, I, I was looking at, it, it was very football oriented, and I thought that was great. And, um, <laughs> So I was looking through this book, I guess it's a book of all the games played by the University of Michigan football team, and lo and behold, I find a, a game between Mich University of Michigan and Columbia University. I think it was actually the Rose Bowl in the 30s, and Columbia lost, but something like 21-14. Now if they played today, I don't think the score would be quite that, that close. So let me just tell you one other uh, Columbia University football story, or anecdote. Um, I was at a, a meeting once with uh, one of the former presidents of Columbia University. And this is during the time that Columbia's football team had lost 44 games in a row. There was a lot of heat. Even the New York Times was picking up on 44 losses, even though it was the Ivy League. And I remember him saying, uh, as long as the number of Nobel laureates associated with Columbia exceeds the number of losses, I was fine with that. And I think, oh my God, how, how Ivy Tower that was. So. Uh, those are my only two Columbia football stories. So again, I want to thank Peter for the invitation to speak today. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, given that this is a policy institute or a healthcare policy and innovation institute, is kind of go through um, a historical perspective on how I came to be where I was or at where I am. Um, I began, uh, like most of us, as an assistant professor at the medical center I wanted to achieve tenure, I wanted to do my research. How did I end up thinking about the future of the, of the, of the dental profession? And I think you'll see, given the sort of path I've, I've, I've drawn on how that occurred. Let's try this. There we go. So I've titled it, Diabetes uh, and Oral Health, Lessons Learned and Implications for the Future of, of, of the Dental Profession. So this is a, uh, I don't know how many of you here are dentists, but um, this is a, a, an intraoral view of a, of a patient who, um, on the palatal surface of a, of a patient, um, who has periodontal disease. And you can see here, this, this is the normal appearing tissue. And, you can see this sort of demarcation between this sort of normal appearing paddle tissue and this sort of granulomatous tissue here, and you also can see evidence of abscesses. So how many of us who are clinicians can actually look, look back and say, who was the patient or what was the event that sort of brought you down a path? And for me, it was actually this patient. I was in practice, part-time practice, 
And this patient shows up in my office, and I, I didn't quite know what this was. The patient had periodontal disease, obviously, and I'm a, a periodontist, but, but I didn't really know what was going on here. And I looked at the medical history as, as we would, and, and there was no indication. Um, but what I came to learn as the patient was evaluated is this is really the, the classical signs of, of diabetes mellitus in, in, in the oral cavity. And it was described in the French literature probably 175 years ago that you had this granulomatous replacement and abscess formation. But at the time, I didn't know it. And I was fascinated by this, this patient. And in many ways, it sort of led to the research that, that has gone on for the last 25 years. So um, my understanding is there are a number of people in this audience who know a lot about diabetes mellitus. Let me just go over some, some facts as they uh, come from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. 9.3% uh, of the population have diabetes mellitus. This is across all age groups. Uh, and about, uh, interestingly enough, about 28% of them, or 28% of them, excuse me, 28% of them are, are not are, are undiagnosed. And then the question of how many of even the diagnosed are well managed is, is another issue. So it's obviously a very major healthcare concern in the United States and, and really across the globe. And if you break this down on the basis of age, in fact, it, things get worse as people get older. And here at the 45 to 64 year olds, you can see it's, it's uh, the percent who have uh, uh, diabetes about 16%. And by the time you're an older adult or the older adult population, it's about one in four are going to have diabetes mellitus. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the differences by, by, uh, by sex. So what are the medical complications? Again, I'm just going to spend just a, a minute on this. Early complications include retinopathy nephropathy and end-stage renal disease, the primary reason for kidney transplants in the United States, macrovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, peripheral and autonomic neuropathy, impaired wound healing. And in 1993, Harold Lowe, who was the director of the NIDCR at that time, had proposed periodontal disease as actually the sixth complication. The, the, the dental profession accepted that. Unfortunately, our, our colleagues in medicine have yet to accept it, but they are beginning to acknowledge that it can become a real problem in a, in a patient who's poorly managed. But what about the oral manifestations? I'm trying to build a case here for why diabetes mellitus is particularly important uh, for, for, for uh, people in the oral healthcare field, but also should be considered by people who are in healthcare in general. What are the oral complications of diabetes mellitus? And actually, there are many. So the first and the, perhaps the most important is periodontal disease. And it's, diabetes mellitus is the only recognized systemic risk factor for periodontal disease. So it's the only cigarette smoking we also know is an important risk factor for, for periodontal disease, but that's more environmental. Well, we also see an increase in, in dental caries in, in people who have periodontal disease, specifically, excuse me, who have diabetes mellitus, specifically um, uh, caries or decay on the root surfaces. Then we also see this tetrad of, of findings that tend to come together, salivary dysfunction, xerostomia, so they get dry mouth, and this is not related to medications but related to the disease, taste and neurosensory disorders, candida infection, which may be as a result of salivary dysfunction or low salivary flow, uh, and then burning mouth syndrome, which also could be a result of, of candida infection. There's also altered tooth eruption in children with diabetes mellitus. Their teeth tend to erupt a little bit sooner than a child who does not have diabetes mellitus. Uh, and, and lastly, and there are others on this list, but I'll just limit it here. Uh, in, in a person who has diabetes mellitus for an extended period of time, some people begin to show this, this parotid swelling, bilateral swelling, which is, is a benign process, but can be quite uh, disfiguring. In, in some individuals. So, so it behooves the dental profession, members of the dental profession, to, to know a great deal about diabetes mellitus and what to look for in the oral cavity. But also there's a concern in the patient who is well managed, perhaps too well managed, that hypoglycemia could result while we're providing dental services. And this can be quite upsetting both to the patient and to the provider if there is a hypoglycemic episode. So again, it, it, it speaks to the issue and the, and the need for uh, for oral health care providers to be very familiar with diabetes mellitus. And this is typically the patient who is, is very well controlled, is taking their medication, may not have eaten before they come to the dental office and then the, 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 the blood glucose level falls to too great, you know, below 50 milligrams per cent or thereabouts. 
So what are the lessons that I've learned? Let me go through all this. That was kind of background. The first question, and this really, again, came from that patient who, who I showed you in the very first slide. What are the mechanistic links to other complications? I, I was interested in inflammation. I'm a periodontist. My area of research was in inflammation. I was looking at inflammatory mediators and different biological fluids, different oral fluids. Um, we said, you know, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something that needs to be, to be looked at. So if you looked at the literature back in the 1990s, why do people who have diabetes mellitus get more periodontal disease? It was attributed to poor wound healing. It was very, very uh, vague and, and, and uh, not descriptive. So I was able to uh, identify at Columbia's uh, Medical Center a colleague, Anne-Marie Schmidt, who some of you may know her name. She, she actually had done a great deal of work working with David Stern on the advanced glycation end products. And she characterized the receptor for advanced glycation end products. And, and, and what you see here is kind of the, what occurs. You have a reducing sugar, such as glucose, will combine with proteins non-enzymatically. So it's not limited by the enzyme. It's just limited, really, by the amount of reducing sugar that's present. And they form a series of chemical changes, shift-based and then amidory products, and ultimately these advanced glycation end products, which really are pro-inflammatory. And you find receptor, the receptors for advanced glycation end products on macrophages and endothelial cells and other cells, but in the oral cavity and in the periodontium, the macrophages and endothelial cells are probably particularly important. So they so tend to stimulate an inflammatory response. And, and here's just the mechanism. You have rage on the surface of the cell, and age then binds with that. And you, through an NF-kappa NF B mechanism, you begin to generate these inflammatory mediators, TNF-alpha, uh, IL-6, et cetera, all of the, all of the the cytokines and inflammatory mediators you're familiar with. So in thinking about this and thinking about Anne Marie's work, we said, well, we really do need to learn more about the role of advanced glycation end products in periodontal disease. So we developed an, a, a mouse model of accelerated periodontal disease in diabetes mellitus. So what we did was, is we took a, a standard strain of, of animal, of, of mouse, and we made them um, diabetic by giving them streptozotocin. And this created a relative insulin deficiency as the beta cells were, were eliminated. Um, we then gave, in certain groups, and I'll show you the four combinations, they're pretty straightforward, they gave them an oral infection with Porphyrmonas gingivalis, which is an organism that has been linked to human periodontal disease and periodontal disease in, in other types of, of mammals as, as well. Um, and then we would sacrifice them over a period of time, one, two, and three months, and we looked at both the bone level the, the, uh, the periodontal bone, the alveolar bone, and we also looked at the, the tissue to see what, what we could find. So the mandibles were dissected, the slides were scanned, and images were, were, were analyzed, and this is the, the kind of thing we would see. So here would be a, a control animal, and this would be the lingual surface of the lower jaw. These would be the, the teeth, and, and this would be the crown portion. This would be the root portion, and we actually measured the the area within each of these, uh, these uh, uh, with a, between the crest of the bone and the cemento enamel junction. Here you can see a control animal, and just for representation, you can see a, a, a test animal in which there was, has been more bone loss. So it was really quite a, quite a precise and, and, and an elegant model. And, and this was the data, and I don't want to spend too much time with this, because again, I'm trying to bring you down this, this, this path. So, so we had, we had three, four combinations. We had animals that were not diabetic and did not receive infection. We had animals that had been made diabetic that did not receive infection. Animals that were not diabetic and had infection, and animals that had both. As you can see here, the greatest amount of bone loss, and this, was, this is depicted through that, through that uh, we used that, uh, um, a, uh, a program to, to identify those odd uh, shapes. Uh, or actually the area within the odd shape, and you can see that when the, there was the double hit of the infection as well as diabetes mellitus present, the amount of bone loss was significantly above any of the other combinations, and it had a very nice stepwise kind of progression. We looked at the tissue for levels of inflammatory mediators associated with periodontal disease, and the, uh, the MMPs, the major metalloproteinase levels were up, TNF-alpha levels were up, IL-6 levels levels were up. So clearly the inflammation was closely linked to the progression of bone loss and this was related to um, levels of age and, and rage. 
So we developed this model or, or conceptualized this model based on our data and, and other people's data that you had uh, the bacterial infection initially because the mouth is always infected. You had this enhanced tissue uh, inflammation as a result of this rage-mediated uh, phenomenon. You begin to see tissue destruction, but then others had shown there was a reduced number in, of, of fibroblasts and other cells that were involved in, in, in repair, uh, likely related to enhanced apoptosis. And this, this model is the one I think that's currently accepted as, as causative, uh, that explains the enhanced periodontal disease in patients with diabetes mellitus. So that was really the first step. We had a, an animal model. We think we had advanced the, the field. But at some point, you have to move to, into the human, and, and we did that. And there was a general understanding in the literature that, that adults who had uh, diabetes mellitus had more periodontal disease. So we proposed to look at early complications of diabetes mellitus. Um, and specifically, we looked at children and adolescents in, a, in, our, in our diabetes center and looked at the changes in the mouth that occurred in patients with uh, diabetes mellitus compared to some controls. So we had children and adolescents who were between 6 and 18 years of age. We looked at them both cross-sectionally and longitudinally for, uh, for patients, and then we had a, a group of age-matched controls, and we explored mechanisms that accounted for periodontal disease as a complication of diabetes mellitus. I'll just show you, summarizing this quickly, there were quite a number of publications that came out of this, that diabetes mellitus promotes periodontal destruction in children. And here's a, let me just sort of lay this out. Here are all subjects. There were a total of 700 individuals in this, I'm sorry, this thing is very, uh, very sensitive. There we go. There were 700 subjects, um, and they were broken down as 6 to 11 years old and 12 to 18 years old. And the end here includes both the cases and controls. So there are 350 cases, 350 uh, controls. And here was the odds ratio of having um, this amount of periodontal disease, which is not an excessive amount, but certainly more than you'd expect for all subjects, for those that were younger, comparing cases and controls, and those that were, were older. And you can see the odds ratios indicated that those with periodontal disease, I'm sorry, those with diabetes mellitus had more periodontal disease than those that did not have diabetes mellitus. And this was statistically significant uh, for all subjects combined, for just the younger individuals, and then it was approached significance for the, for the 12 to 18 year olds. Now these, these children, we, we also, given that we were working at the at Diabetes Center, we were able to have fundus photography. We looked at the, the retina of these individuals. We also looked at the kidney function, and they did not manifest those early uh, clinical signs of diabetes mellitus. So the periodontal changes, which were subtle, but able to be visualized in the mouth, uh, were occurring very early in the disease, certainly earlier than, or maybe even the same time, as one can argue. Um, as, as the early other complications. And then we looked at what were the parameters that actually identified these children. And in fact, here you can see we looked at mean HbA1c. This is over a two-year period, if they, or as long as we had data for them, the duration of diabetes, mellitus, or the BMI for age. And in all cases, whether you looked at the entire cohort, you looked at just the younger individuals or the older individuals, it was the mean HbA1c, which was in keeping with other complications that had been seen in some of the major trials, such as the DCCT, DCCT trial, that, that HbA1c, or at least elevations of HbA1c, were, were linked to uh, complications. So that was the, the second uh, lesson, and let me summarize all the work we had done. There was evidence of increased periodontal destruction in children and adolescents with diabetes mellitus. Periodontal complications occurred before other clinical complications. Maybe I'll walk that back and say certainly at the same time of it, perhaps earlier than other complications, because we didn't do kidney biopsies or anything like that. We did do retinal uh, photography, however. Uh, the elevated mean HbA1c is a significant risk factor for periodontitis in these children. So it was linked to that, and again, that was in keeping with what others had found for complications in the relationship to HbA1c. So that was the second lesson. We had gone from an animal model to a cross-sectional and short-term longitudinal trial with children and adolescents, and then at some point we said, hey, we've got to take this one step further, and we've got to see where, what role can oral health care providers have in, in diagnosing unidentified or undiagnosed diabetes mellitus? And this was kind of, this is where the policy part really came in. 
th there were many complications that could occur in the mouth. There was a variety of other reasons which I'll outline why uh, oral health care providers, dentists, hygienists, and others need to be aware. Could we really make something of this? Did we really be able to show that, that we could have an effect? So we created a, a, a trial that uh, was, was a cross-sectional trial with the exception of one part, which I'll show you. Uh, and, this was, and the aim was to develop and evaluate a targeted screening protocol for undiagnosed dyslysemia, both diabetes mellitus and, and prediabetes, in patients presenting at a, at a dental clinic. And here's, here's the rationale for the study. So first of the increasing prevalence of DM was acknowledged, 28% of those were un, unidentified, undiagnosed. We know that the complications of DM, if allowed to occur, if the disease is allowed to occur, associated with increased morbidity and mortality, in addition to enormous cost to the, to the healthcare system. We know that early diagnosis of DM or prediabetes with treatment or with some sort of intervention would reduce the complications, both in intensity and frequency. Patients with DM have oral complications. I showed you that in one of the earlier slides. There were eight. There, there, there are also indications that, that there are changes to um, implants, very popular today in dental therapy. Uh, implants are at risk in patients with diabetes mellitus. That oral complications of DM occur early. We showed, you that, we showed that in the, in the child, in the children's study, children and adolescent study. Uh, and su successful dental care for patients with DM requires good metabolic control to avoid hypoglycemia, but also we recognize that if you treat, let's say, do periodontal therapy on a patient who has periodontitis but also have diabetes mellitus, if the diabetes mellitus is not well controlled, the patient does not respond well to therapy. So here's just an example of a, of a kind of patient that we were interested in. Uh, this was not a patient in the study, so you can see here that there's obviously been a fair amount of tooth loss. And you can also see here this, that the, the tissue inflammation is, is marked. Uh, and here's the palatal surface, the inside surface of that same patient. And you can look at the unusual, uh, again, for those that are not dentists, you may not see it, but the, this is a, a lot of inflammation with unusual architecture to the tissue. This has obviously been a very uh, fulminant and, and rapidly progressive type of uh, of periodontal disease, and this happened to be a patient with diabetes mellitus, just not, not in our study. Uh, again, here's another appearance of the mandibular anterior on the lingual surface. So we, we created, we, we performed a study that um, was, was actually a, a really a labor of love, and because, so I was the dean at the time, so I, I, I could tell the clinic, okay, it was, it was okay to do this, because obviously it, 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 it it interrupted the flow of, of clinical activities in the dental school. It became really a challenge to finish this study when I, when I left the deanship. <laughs> nobody, want, nobody thought we should disrupt the clinic as, as we were, but they, they agreed to do it. So uh, let me go through this study, and I think you'll see why it's important. So in this first phase of the study, there were 600 new patients who had come to the dental school for dental services. They didn't know anything about diabetes mellitus, didn't come there, come there with this on, the thought. And the entry criteria included you had to be over 40 years old if you were white, or over 30 years old if you were Hispanic or non-white. And this reflects, obviously, the, what, what occurs in, in, the, um, in, in the population. And they never had to have been told that they had a history, that they personally had a history of, of diabetes mellitus. And obviously, they had to agree to, to participate in the study. Um, of the 601 that originally were screened, about 90%, 89% of those, also answered yes to at least one of four questions. And these questions were, you had, do you have a family history of diabetes mellitus? And, and here we were talking about any family history. It didn't have to be a parent or a sib. It could be a first cousin. Uh, did you personally have hypertension? Do you personally ever been told you had high cholesterol? And were you ever told you were overweight and obese? And they had to obviously agree to, to, to uh, participate and complete the protocol, which was also going to include a, a complete periodontal examination and a point of care HbA1c test, a chair site HbA1c test. And here was the analyzer that we used. There, there are a number of them there now today. The, they're much smaller, much less expensive, but just to give you an idea of what we were using at the time. And here's the first interesting finding from, from the study. Of those 535 that were offered the opportunity to be in the study, 96% of them agreed to participate. And it, because 
you know, a lot of that happened at that very first visit, but they also had to come back the next morning for a, a blood draw for a fasting plasma glucose. So, but 96% of people who come for a dental visit, came for a dental visit in our community, we're in northern Manhattan, primarily Hispanic, a low SES um, population, agreed to come back, which I think is really, is, is really pretty remarkable. Um, let's see, let me, let me go back a second. Um, and they had to come in for a blood draw for FPG. They had to come back the next day. So what did we find for these, for these 506 individuals? We found that 4.2% were in the diabetes range, and this is by the FPG test, not by the HbA1c, the chair side HbA1c, and 32% were identified with pre, in the pre-diabetes range. So we thought about this, and they said, well, maybe we can refine the algorithm. Because we were testing all of these people we'd get a lot of negatives. We, we would actually get 64% who, who were not in, in, in the range. So uh, what we were seeing is that, you know, given this, these criteria of age and health history, we, we saw a yield of 36%. But we wanted to improve the algorithm, and the way we, the first thing we looked at is what happens if we looked at the oral examination data? Because remember, they had a complete periodontal exam, which included periodontal disease as well as tooth loss. And if we considered the number of, the percent of teeth with of ten of teeth with at least one site of five millimeters. This is a, an indication of the existence of some periodontal disease, or they had at least four missing teeth. If we added that to the algorithm, we could improve. Gee, I'm sorry about this. The very sensitive. We can improve the algorithm to between 73 and 92 percent yield, which which made a lot of sense. So here we're combining the oral data and the health history data to in increase the yield. And if you look at this, this is the criteria to your left would be uh, what were used, and, and it was specifically focused on sensitivity. How many of those who had disease were identified as having disease? If we looked at uh, the, the teeth that had um, uh, periodontal disease by measured by teeth pockets or, or missing teeth, we yield a sensitivity of 0.73. If we combine that with the point of care HbA1c, we, we were up to 92%, and we looked at just the point of care HbA1c, 75%. So you can see how these numbers are, are fairly comparable. So, so there, there did seem to be a linkage. So, so here I am, just you know, trying to go along, trying to, to, to move this forward, and, and this path was, was continuing. We, we, then, we then expanded the study, because right about this time, HbA1c, laboratory, HPLC, HbA1c became a criteria for identifying prediabetes and diabetes mellitus. So we, we then added a second component to the study with the same entry criteria, but the outcome was, or, or the definitive diagnosis was provided by H, the laboratory HbA1c. So we ended up with 1,240 uh, individuals originally. Uh, about 1,100 of them uh, met the, the criteria. Again, the same criteria which I talked about. And if you look, at, at, so, so the definitive diagnosis with either a next day FPG, fasting plasma glucose, or the same day HPLC, H, HPLC, HbA1c test, that made it so much easier for the, for the patients to come in. Um, we, we found, and this is identified down here, 5.6 would have been in the diabetes range and 35% would have been in the pre-diabetes range. And these are people who were just coming to a dental clinic for, for dental services without any indication of a history of diabetes, I'm sorry, with an indication that they had diabetes mellitus. So that was the third lesson. I'm continuing to develop this. Um, we were running out of money at this point. We had support from, from NIDCR, and then we had support from industry, but we were, we were running out of, met, out of, out of funding. But we, we wanted to see um, whether the fact that we can identify a patient who was at risk, we're not diagnosing anything, a person who was at risk for diabetes mellitus or prediabetes, would take our advice and come and, and follow through with a medical provider to begin some sort of treatment or some sort of, of intervention. Um, and we had enough to do a small randomized control, enough funds to do a small randomized control trial to, to just look at what the, how the referral was, was uh, accepted by these individuals. Because obviously, identifying the risk for disease or even disease and then not getting treatment, you've accomplished absolutely nothing. So 
we refer to this as a referral pilot and, and medical follow-up study. And what we did is we took 100 patients, or 101 patients, and we created two groups. And most of these were, in the, at, at least at our analysis, had been in the pre-diabetes range. Seven were in the diabetes range. Uh, we, we divided them into two groups randomly. Half of them uh, received an intensive intervention. We would talk to them about what the findings were. We would give them a letter. We would call their physician or their health care provider. We would follow up within a week. We'd follow up within two months to see what they have done. And the other was, was giving a, a, a more a regular, what we called a regular intervention, in where they were told, they were given a letter, but we didn't follow up. We did say we we're going to call you in six months to come back to the dental clinic, but we, they, we, uh, we didn't follow up in, intensively. And, and let me say that the results were essentially the same. There's no statistical difference between the two, so I'm going to lump all of this together. And, and what we see here is that the, of this 101 patients, 73 of them, so about 73%, returned to the dental clinic six months later. We called them, we said, we want to see you, would you, would you come back? 70%, better than 70% came back. And this was being, they were being seen not for dental care at this return visit. They were being seen for a follow-up to discuss what they had gone with. They, had they seen a medical provider, what was, what was done? Um, and looking at this 73%, 60 of them, nearly 60%, had seen a medical provider and a certain percent were, were tested, et cetera. We have all sorts of data as to what kind of intervention there was. Um, so we, we, this, was, this was pretty good. We, we thought this was pretty good. Patients, especially where we were, um, they don't always follow through on, on, uh, on health care advice or suggestions. They, it's not like we could just take them to the next room and say, here's a physician or here's a some medical provider that you could see. They actually actively had to, had to go seek uh, someone out. For the intensive group, we tried to uh, assist with that. But we were very happy with this return, a 60% return. And I'm going to show you, these are these are hard to, to assess, but just let me show you how the HbA1c, the chair-side HbA1c, changed between the initial view and the secondary, and the second view at six months. And this was the, um, these were the patients who had prediabetes. Uh, and this was the basic group, this is the intense, group, intense uh, intervention group. And, and you can sort of see a trend here, and I'll just show you one other slide and then I'll tell you about the summary statistics. This, these were the people who were in the diabetes range, and you can see that here, all above 6.5. We felt that this might have been a, an outlier, so just looking at all of these individuals, uh, my, or excuse me, all the, these, as opposed to seven of them, just six of the individuals taking this outlier out, you can see they all went from the diabetes range above 6.5 to the, to the pre-diabetes range. Um, so if you look at the, the, the total population, about 60%, uh, about 30% of them, 32%, I believe, improved in terms of this chair-side HbA1c, uh, or at least improved from, let's say, a pre-diabetes to, to normal glycemic range, or diabetes to pre-diabetes. About 32% about of those improved, 60% stayed in the same category, and 8% actually got worse. And those are people who were in the normal range who, who then went up and who then, who then increased. So, so that was the lesson, or at least the, the, uh, the fourth lesson that, that we had learned, that you could have a screening for diabetes mellitus in patients who were being seen for routine dental care, and that you could make a difference in terms of their um, accessing health care and beginning to address their, their dysglycemia. So the, the next uh, part of the study that we, we picked up on was something that um, obviously is of great concern today and certainly of concern here in the Institute. What is the economic impact of early diagnosis of diabetes mellitus by oral health care providers? So you figure with early diagnosis, there's going to be a saving of some sort. And we were reacting to, to things like this. This is an infographic that had been uh, produced by the American Dental Association. Um, and they talked about screening for chronic diseases in the dental office, as, as Peter knows and as Wenchi knows. There, there's a, the editor of the Journal of the American Dental Association is a, is a big believer in this and has been moving this forward in, in the ADA. But there's a box as part of this infographic, and this, the outline is mine. Uh, we, we outline this. It said, screening for chronic diseases in dental offices could reduce U.S. health care costs by up to $100 million. And, and frankly, we thought this was naive um, because 
if you, if you, obviously, if you have a person who has, who identify early who has dysglycemia, they're going to go into some sort of treatment or require some sort of intervention, and that's going to cost money. And that didn't seem to be considered in this particular, um, this particular calculation. So we engaged one of the health economists at, at Columbia, Matt Nidell, and we looked at the cost effectiveness of diabetes screening initiated through a dental visit. And we used the, the Archimedes uh, simulation model to, to identify the cost associated with treating prediabetes or, or diabetes mellitus. And here you can see the cost effectiveness of the Weight Watchers intervention for pre-diabetic populations. There's a whole bunch of different combinations. The Archimedes uh, simulation, and it is a simulation, obviously that's a, a drawback. Uh, because you're not actually following the patient to see what their costs would be, but it's a, it's a well-recognized and accepted uh, algorithm. We, we looked at the cost effectiveness of Weight Watchers intervention for, for the pre-diabetics, and again, many, com many different combinations in the paper, but just to show you one, so we looked at quality of, of life years, which is how, what the outcome is here, and a quality of life year, uh, less than about $50,000 is considered to be cost, cost effective, and obviously here we can we, we were getting below this $50,000 range, and uh, depending upon the decay, in other words, if the patient returned to their original weight or was able to maintain the reduced weight, again, this is all in, in the model, it was amazingly cost-effective, but it was, n it was with cost. It was with cost. You're not going to just save $100 million. So the conclusions were the identifications of persons with dysglycemia in the dental office uh, for uh, initiating pre-diabetic care is a cost-effective means of identifying and treating affected individuals. Costs were noticeably higher for people with diabetes mellitus, as you'd expect. When medications start to become involved, and, and not just metformin, but some of the newer generation medications, the, the uh, cost went up. So, so we need to be realistic. You can't just say that screening in the dental office is going to save money. There's going to be a cost associated with preventing the complications that will occur down the, the road. So I and, and Peter Poverini and a variety of others have begun to think about ways in which the dental um, profession and the practice of dentistry in the United States can evolve to include other things that typically are not done. And um, we, I put together a, a, a monograph um, engaging some people who've been thinking about this to look at a variety of different types of activities that occur in the, in the dental office and, and look at the literature to suggest what could happen. And if you look at this, this area, the whole idea of primary health care in the dental office, there's some people who are proposing a very broad range of activities from lipid screening to a variety of other things. This monograph attempted to look at things that were really much more relevant to the dental profession and to dental practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So certainly, they've talked about assessing hypertension in the dental office. It's been talked about for 50 years, maybe, maybe longer than that. You certainly don't want to give epinephrine to a patient who's hypertensive, et cetera. But just to go through a few of these, smoking cessation. Oral cancer, traditional oral cancer, or oral cancer that's not HPV associated, as well as periodontal disease, are directly linked to smoking. And you can't treat these diseases unless you get the patient to stop smoking, but this is traditionally not performed, not done in the dental office. Diabetes screening we just, we just talked about. Obesity management. I mean, dentists and oral health care providers know a fair amount about carbohydrate intake and the importance of diet as it relates to oral disease. Could there perhaps be an identification of the, of the overweight or the obese patient? And whether, if the, the oral health care provider says, I don't want to manage this myself, it may be awkward to, to take some of the measurements that are required, they could then be a source of referral to someone who can me measure or could manage the, the obesity management. Identification of osteoporosis from dental radiographs. You don't use a dental radiograph to identify osteoporosis, but the data already exists. There's already available x-rays in a dental office, and there are some interesting algorithms and interesting uh, programs that have been created that show that you can, with reasonable accuracy, identify osteoporosis from this already existing database. And lastly, and there are others, I mean, this is an obvious one, identification of suspicious dermatological diseases. We always tell our dental students, don't look immediately at the teeth. You know, look at the patient, look, look at the ear, look at the forehead, look at the facial skin, look at the exposed skin surfaces to see if there are, are lesions that need to be of, that are of concern. 
So I think it's pretty obvious that the result of this shift will be improved health, not just oral health. And the key here for, for many of us is when we talk about the future of the profession, is the dental profession going to continue to be siloed the way it has been for, for decades and, and decades, certainly since 1965 when it was excluded from Medicare, but even before that, or will we become a more important part of healthcare in general? So it's very easy to say these things. It's much more difficult to operationalize these things. So we began to talk a little bit now, and I'll just go through this very quickly because I want to leave some time for, for questions and back and forth, is to think about how the dynamics of, of dental practice will have to change if you, if you adopt this. So here's what we do currently. We, we spend a fair amount of time, not a great amount of time, on, on diagnosis and, and treatment planning. Our interdisciplinary activities, our interaction with physicians and pharmacists and nurses and social workers is, is pretty limited. Basically what we do is we provide dental services. And, and uh, we do spend some time uh, supervising auxiliaries. Most dentists have a dental hygienist in their office and there's a, a relationship between uh, the two of them. But in the future, if this concept that we're proposing is, a, is adopted, it will have to change. You'll spend more time on diagnosis because it won't be just, and, and diagnosis is a broad term, it won't just be evaluating the oral cavity for disease and treatment planning, but looking at the patient who may be at risk for, for NCDs. We'll spend obviously more time in interdisciplinary activities. You're gonna to have to communicate with physicians and pharmacists, pharmacists and, and diabetes educators and, and, and others. We'll spend less time, perhaps, on actually providing services. And here I'm talking about the, the dentist who will spend less time providing dental services because this time has to come from somewhere and perhaps we should be giving, oops, perhaps we should be giving greater responsibility to auxiliaries so they can work to their level of, of education as well. But here, try, but, but we've learned the hard way that, again, you can't be naive. I can get up and talk about this, but how do you operationalize this? Well, first thing you have to look at is, is state practice acts. What are dentists or oral health care providers allowed to do? So I, I asked a student, and that's what students are good for. They're good for many things. But I said to them, I want you to go and look at every practice act of all 50 states. And, and, and what do they say? The, the, and, the, and the American Dental Association has defined dentistry very broadly. And, and it, just to sort of paraphrase, it, it says diseases of the oral cavity and the, and the, uh, the mouth um, and in contiguous structures. And there's a phrase, and their effect on the body, and their effect on the entire body. And that language actually is in about half of the state practice acts, which gives much more leeway. And about half the, the other half of the states uh, the, the definition is much more narrow. It defines you know, repair of tooth, diseases of the teeth, of the periodontium, et cetera, removal of third molars, much more prescriptive. So about half the states have a very broad, um, a very broad definition. And when we were thinking about, I was thinking about as in my life in public health school about how do we actually bring this into practice in New York State I, I was thinking about a, a legislative approach where we get someone, uh, a legislator in the assembly or senate to sponsor a bill and then move this forward to, let's say, diabetes testing and, and, and primary health care activities and screening can be conducted in the dental office. I went to talk to the New York State Dental Association. She said, you don't need to do that because we can do it right now and we'll defend anyone who is sued for that reason. So, and I had some funding from the, the, the New York State Health Foundation to, to look at this. We created a brief. and. Um, apparently, they're, they're very willing to, c to consider this. Whoops, what did I do? Okay. So the second issue, and maybe even the first issue, is reimbursement. No matter how much good work, or how, many good, how much good would come out of this, unless you provide reimbursement, um, even modest reimbursement, you're not going to get buy-in from the profession. And um, the question of how do you do this is, 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 a, is a challenge. Um, I sat on a redesign team for our Medicaid program in, in New York State. Um, I think it could come through a Medicaid program. Um, we have a very robust dental benefit, adult be dental benefit in New York, and they've already approved a smoking cessation as a compensatable uh, service in the dental office. Reimbursement through that mechanism is possible. But a number of the insurance companies have actually started to think now innovatively about how they can provide additional dental benefits for patients with NCDs, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes mellitus. 
Obviously, we're going to have to revise our dental school curriculum to prepare students to do this. I think some schools it will be rather easy to do, the schools that have an emphasis on basic sciences. For some schools, it's not going to be as easy. We feel that, um, for those of you who do not know, in many places in the United States, when you graduate dental school, you can go into practice if you, pra if you pass a licensing exam. A number of states have started to pass mandatory PGY-1, and this would be an ideal place to further emphasize the importance of this and to bring this into the practice mentality of, of new dentists. Uh, this is not certainly across the entire United States. What about the acceptance by oral health care providers? Surveys suggest they'd be willing to do it. Uh, these have been, I think, somewhat superficial surveys. When we've looked at this in greater detail, there was a lot of hesitancy really around knowledge. How much knowledge do, do the providers have in order to be able to talk intelligently and comfortably with patients about what the findings would be? So this has to be addressed. The acceptance by patients has been generally quite positive. Um, and, and again, some, some studies suggest that patients are, are willing to go through the testing, but they don't follow up. In some cases, they, they do follow up, but this has to be addressed. And lastly is the acceptance by other healthcare providers. How will physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs and others feel about dentists doing this? And at the medical center, at least, and that's probably not the best gauge, certainly not the gauge of the community, there was very good acceptance of, of what we were doing. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to leave, uh, I left about 10 minutes for, for questions. As I said in, in the beginning, uh, it's, it's really important for, for people like me to hear from people like you about the concerns and, and the issues because we spend a lot of time talking to one another and patting each other on the back and telling each other how good an idea this is. But I'd rather hear from others about, about their concerns and about any questions that might arise. So please, questions. Absolutely perfect argument. There's no question that this should be adapted tomorrow. Adapted tomorrow. Great talk. I uh, really like the, the uh, progression from basic science into the clinical realm. Remember, this is a, someone who was just concerned about getting tenure originally and, and it, it moved from that into a, into a School of Public Health. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, I, I wonder whether you thought much about the ecological model and other um, uh, social or physical, uh, uh, physical environment risk factors that may be contributing to periodontal disease in people with diabetes, uh, especially in the community where the Columbia Medical Center is. But, but well, by ecological model, you're referring to access to care and to uh, yeah. There's no question that, that that comes into play. But in the study of uh, almost 1,100 people. They were, the, they were the same people coming from the community. They didn't differ in terms of their ethnicity. They didn't differ in terms of, of sex. Um, you know, periodontal disease is a, complicated, is a complex disease, but there's no question that diabetes mellitus is a risk factor, the only systemic disease that's a risk factor for, for periodontal disease. Uh, smoking exists too. But the groups did not differ in terms of their smoking uh, history. So, so I think, yes, I think there are unanswered questions in the model, but the reality is we identified 40% of the people who were dysglycemic. And, and whether you know, prediabetes is really something that need, people need to be concerned with, because we encountered some of that, actually, in the, in the interviews that we did with the 70 some odd who came back. Uh, you know, what did your physician, or mostly physician, in some cases it was a nurse practitioner, think about this? And in some cases they said, oh, don't worry about that. You know, you're not 6.5, let me tell you how the scale goes. You really don't have to worry about it now. We'll worry until it gets a little, a little bit higher. Because these are people who live in economically stressed areas and they have a lot of things to be, to be concerned with. Um, but uh, I, I don't think, I think it's an important issue, but I don't think it takes away from the funding. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, it's just a related question. Um, just because we know that there are significant access issues for dental care, I would imagine that there are high, very high rates of diabetes and prediabetes among those who are not able to get to the dentist's office. I was just curious as it relates to the reimbursement about for people who don't necessarily have dental coverage but may have medical coverage, whether there's a way to then kind of encourage yeah. them to get to the dental office and find out other ways to get their care covered or some of it covered so that they're kind of caught by your, by your model. So I'm not quite sure I understand question, but let me try to answer 
what I think you're asking, and if not, you'll, you'll correct me. Sure. I think that um, one of the things we know is that patients with diabetes, if you can look at patients with diabetes mellitus and how often they visit the ophthalmologist, the podiatrist, and the dentist, they visit the dentist the least of, of, of all of those other providers and below the national averages. And I think that's because their medical providers are not sending the message, you've got to have your eyes checked, you've got to have your feet checked, but you also need to have your mouth checked. And so we've started a dialogue recently for, with the American Association of Diabetes Educators, figuring that maybe the, the endocrinologist, the primary care physician, the family physician are too busy, the diabetes educators need to know about this and then they can start spreading, spreading the word. So part of it is, is the whole issue of, of access to care. And if you're asking, if those people who don't see a physician are, not, are also not going to see a dentist, I think there's certainly some, some truth to that. We just completed a study with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to look at primary care visits, medical visits and dental visits in, 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 as part of a, a New York City survey. And a surprisingly high number, I don't have the data, so I don't want to quote specifics. I don't have to, we haven't finished the data, but a surprisingly high number of people have dental visits in New York City, but do not have medical visits. Now, it's not 90%, but it could be 10 or 15%. So even if you catch some of those numbers, some of those individuals, you're not going to catch everyone, but you can catch enough where it could, could impact, uh, and, and obviously with, with follow-up, you're going to make a difference. I was actually thinking a little bit, in addition to the access to care, just about, specifically about dental insurance and the fact that there are lower rates of dental insurance coverage than there are medical insurance yes, coverage, yes. and that's one of the big barriers. Yeah. They understand it to people accessing dental care. Certainly true, mm -hmm. but in our area, um, uh, Medicaid is is the major uh, provide, uh, insurer. And what's interesting, and, and we maybe think of your question, is we looked at the utilization of medical services and dental services in our catchment area for people with Medicaid, and about 85% of them on an annual basis access medical care and about 45% increase uh, utilized or access dental care, even though they had the insurance. But across the country, there's no question that, that um, more people have medical coverage than have dental coverage. Things are going to get appear to be getting worse and, and, not, and not better. Uh, but even if we catch the, the 45% or have access to the 45%, and I'm not even talking here about the people who, who, have, who are aware of the diagnosis but are poorly managed, just those that are not, who are, who are um, not diagnosed, have never been identified, I think there's a potential to make a difference. And again, you could tweak the model, find different ways to, we had actually even talked to the New York State Health Foundation about a, um, a, an ad approach that can be in dental offices, where you'd have just a simple little stand up about, ask your dentist about diabetes in the mouth. So, so I think there are all different ways that you could you can approach it. It needs to be a, a more defined strategy. Perhaps uh, not a not a question, but a, but a comment. And uh, certainly appreciate your presentation. I thought it was really quite good, from basic science up to uh, the clinical Thank piece. I'm concerned about the dramatic increase of diabetes in our country, and it's related to lifestyle, dietary issues, and so forth. So from a public health perspective, um, it's all well and good that we're trying to identify people with diabetes, but probably as a country as a whole, we need to be focusing to a great extent on preventing people from getting diabetes in the first place. So. I think this is a, a, a great step forward, uh, but we need to kind of perhaps also look at the big picture. So, so if I didn't know better, I would suggest that's a planted question. <laughs> because um, one of the things that we've been looking at now is how do you improve oral hygiene? Because we know that patients don't listen to us when we tell them to do that. And one of the approaches that we're considering now is providing a lifestyle message in the dental office. Because if you go back to this slide, um, whether, it's, whether it's personal hygiene or diet or exercise, they all fit in pretty nicely with a number of these, or smoking cessation, they all fit in pretty nicely with this model, Maybe not exactly. And, and here you can say, I'm gonna to talk to you about your oral hygiene, but the first thing I wanna to talk to you about is your lifestyle and, and smoking cessation and, and weight and diet. So there's a message that can be delivered 
by oral health care providers that fit into this new model of dental practice that is in perfect agreement with what you're saying. So the one slide where you, that one right there, if you go back to that slide where you show a different distribution yeah. of time uh, in the future. So one possibility may be that you may be educating different types of dentists dentists that may actually invest much more time in diagnosis and patient education and less time in dental services. Because if you take a look at the expanding group of for-profit dental schools, you know, that do not invest in research and discovery, which would kind of be important to really educate the students to be able to function in that, group, in that sort of domain of primary care. Is it a possibility that we're actually dealing with a tiered level of, of dental practitioner? You know, I mean, I, you know, I realize that's, yeah. that's heresy, but no. frankly, that's what we're doing so, right so now. So I don't know how many of you know Dr. Poverini's uh, history. He's, he's outlawed in, in eight states in the United <laughs> States. He can't step foot in eight states because of, <laughs> of course, if it, but I, I think you're exactly right. I, I mean, it's, it may be heresy to say that we educate dentists. There, there are two types of, there's more of a mechanical dentist and more of the stomatologist. I think that's a hard sell, but it's what's happening organically, right? The, the schools like Columbia and Michigan and Harvard and Penn and University of Washington, they're educating students to on a broader with a broader mindset. And then you have these other schools, the schools that are not affiliated with allopathic medical schools or medical centers, that are doing a much providing much more of a technical mechanical type of a um, of a of, of an education and. All I know is that we've got to change. If we keep doing what we've done for the last 100 years, we're going to be, as a profession, we're going to be relegated to the, to, to the allied health world and, and not where I think we should be and where many of us feel we can make a difference. And uh, that simply has to be a reality. I think how we do it, and you and I had some a very preliminary discussion, I think it's got to be more of a soft sell, at least initially. But the message is the right one. I mean, you can't. People will need a certain training, a certain education, in order to be able to adopt the new model. And you know, one of the things that I always hear when I present this is, well, we, you know, it's no, we don't generate any income or we do reduction in income. From a case study of one, when I was in practice, I, people knew I was interested in diabetes mellitus. I, didn't have a, I was only practicing a, a day a week. But I would see a fair number of people with, with diabetes mellitus referred by physicians the point is, it's, it's an opportunity to, to have a new patient flow. We know that 40%, only 40% of adults today, or 42% of adults today, see a dentist in a, in a year's time. I mean, we, if, even if we increase that 7 or 8% because of this flow between medical providers, nurse practitioners, physicians, et cetera, and, and dental offices, there alone will we'll make up in volume what we might be able, to, what we're maybe losing. Because obviously, this is where the income is generated. The, the, the larger procedures, the, the reconstructive procedures, the implants, this is where the money comes in. And, and the reality is this could be used to fund the other things. And plus, um, this whole issue of what, our, what, our, um, what other members of the dental team are actually doing, I think is really, really very, very important. Dentists spend too much time doing things that they're, they're, they're trained to do much more than didn't come out quite right, but they're just doing procedures that you do not need someone with all that education to, to be performed. Well, thank you. Good questions. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to present this in, a, in, a, in this venue. It's certainly a distinguished university. And again, I thank Peter for his invitation.